interesting theme. We have um, a discussion around Nigeria and Pakistan, uh, the corridor, investing corridor. In fact, Nigeria and Pakistan are like two brothers, which are sp spread across two different continents. They got at point, I'm sure, at the time of the great tectonic plate movement, they got separated because we are actually very similar countries. Um, we have both, Nigeria has 211 million people, uh, Pakistan has 225 million people. We have uh, 1567 uh, dollars per GDP of capita. Uh, Nigeria has 2085. Um, uh, Nigeria has is a bit more urbanized. They have about 50% urbanized country. We have 37 in Pakistan. Um, and again, we are both very youthful and young population. Lots of energy, lots of creativity. And um, Nigeria has about 70% population that is below 30. So you're doing, uh, you're ahead of us. Um, and we have 64%. Uh, the median age again in Nigeria is quite low, it's 18 years. And we have got 22.8 years, which basically means a lot more consumption is gonna happen in the future. So lots and lots of growth to happen. And, um, and so in a lot of ways, we have similar evolution also. We've had experiences of military rule over the last 40, 50 years. Um, and in a way, that's why I say we are like two brothers that got separated at the time of the great tectonic plate movement because we are very similar. Nigeria is doing very well in technology, in investing, and it's something that we would like to emulate and we are slightly behind the curve. Uh, so Nigerians, uh, Nigerian venture capital, raised $793 million in 2021. And Pakistan was behind the curve. We had $377 million we've raised in 2021. So there's a lot of things that are similar. There are lots of things that, and there are a few things that are different, but I think there's a lot to learn. We are heavy populated countries. We have own historical baggage, traditional businesses. And I think for a lot of young people, the great hope of tech, venture is of economic prosperity, is of employment, is of growth, uh, which is the case in Pakistan, and I'm sure is the case in, in, in Nigeria also. So to, to discuss that, to find out more about the personal stories from Pakistan, but also the personal stories from, uh, from Nigeria, we've got a fascinating panel. Myself, let me introduce myself. My name is Ahmed Jalal. I grew up mostly in Pakistan, and then I was in London. I worked at Goldman Sachs. Um, where I worked with some Nigerian uh, colleagues. Um, then I went to the Kennedy School of Government. I worked in venture capital, private equity in the Middle East. And now I've been back in Pakistan for the last five years, uh, running a operating venture or what we call studio, venture studio by the name of Cordoba Ventures. So building up businesses from grounds up or also investing in, in, in founders. And, and one of the things that my realization is we are highly operating intensive uh, countries. So you need a lot of handholding, a lot of support. Founders do need that. So this kind of venture investing that we do in Pakistan needs to be tweaked, can't be the same as one that is done in the Silicon Valley. So I, I will get myself out of the way and to discuss these topics with the people on the ground and people in Nigeria, our, our friends and our colleagues in Nigeria. Just to give you something, I'm wearing something called the Ajrak. The Ajrak is a Sindhi uh, kind of a shawl and I do wear it because I do sometimes feel envious of some of the Nigerians who wear very flashy clothes and, um, and very, very flamboyant clothes. So, so, and today I'm wearing it because it's Sindh Ajrak, Sindh Culture Day. And Ajrak is a great symbolism of, of Sindh. And I come, I'm sitting based in Karachi. And, um, and so I thought to, to wear the symbolism of the Sindhi culture. Um, and so with that, I have, uh, I'll introduce the panel who are with me. Um, we have a, a long list of panelists and, um, and uh, some of them uh, have to, may have to leave a bit early, um, but I would like the panelists to both introduce themselves, uh, their personal journey both in terms of found being founders and also uh, being you know, venture capitalists and what were the learnings that they got from, um, from their experience, whether working in Pakistan or working in Nigeria. And, and people like Salim Bhai, who has actually lived in Nigeria, but also is from Pakistan, um, and, uh, and how does the experience or the Nigerian experience translate across to success in Pakistan and vice versa from what happens in Pakistan can go across to Nigeria. Um, so, so with that, I'd like to bring in my first um, panelist, uh, Hema Velab, 
who's who's based in in uh, South Africa, um, but uh, invests across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this time talking mostly about Nigeria. Uh, Hema, over to you to talk about, to discuss about uh, uh, the venture space, the startup space in Nigeria um, and investing in and growing businesses over there. Over to you, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, I hope you can hear and see me clearly. Um, just give me a shout if, uh, if the signal drops a bit. Um, but thank you, too. it's an honor to be here and thank you so much for the invite. I guess as a quick introduction, I am I'm sort of the outsider looking in, right? So I'm from South Africa, so not from Nigeria, disclosure, and of course of Indian heritage. Um, so on the outside of both countries, but very much an insight into both given the work and the journey that I've had. Um, you know, in a nutshell, I am an engineer turned entrepreneur now turned investor. And my background, my journey has very much been around developing um, founders in engineering and tech but specifically with the gender focus. Um, where I sit today um, is having started a group of companies developing engineering and tech talent, um, female founders, co-working spaces and innovation hubs, and now working with Sinead to raise 535 Ventures, um, a pan-African VC fund investing in tech-enabled businesses across the continent. And you know, one cannot talk about the continent without having a keen eye on what's happening in Nigeria. It, it really is, um, you know, the VC booming um, golden child, not just from a fintech space, which we all know is very sexy, but there's just so much bubbling. And, you know, I mean, you, 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 you couldn't have said it better around the similarities between um, Nigeria and Pakistan from size of the country, the demographic, um, and just the emerging markets. But I think one thing you failed to mention was just there's something about a thirst on those in these countries, right? There's a drive that these entrepreneurs have to solve real world problems. You know, we're not sitting in Silicon Valley and, you know, seeing all these additional things like and I, and I, and I don't need to rub off in the wrong way but you know putting people on Mars and the like we're solving real world problems for a population that is you know thriving and looking to grow in meaningful impactful ways but absolutely enjoying the economic benefits and prosperity that you know playing in the VC startup environment brings so for me that's the very keen eye on which I'm looking into Nigeria um, 535 is a young fund. We've already done 18 investments, of which five of them are in Nigeria. And I think that speaks for itself. Um, and you know, as we look across the corridor, one of the things we as VCs do, especially investing in seed stage businesses, is thinking about our company's growth. And while there's a lot of opportunity on the continent, where do they grow afterwards? And yeah, sure, your usual suspects are there, but it's really about building these relationships and bridges. I would love my portfolio companies to one day, you know, build partnerships in your region and see how do we have some, you know, mutual cross-pollination. Um, I'll leave it at that for now, but I'm looking forward to the discussion. And there is a statistic that one in five African is a Nigerian uh, or something like that, one in four or one in five. So, so, the, so you'll find a lot of Nigerians across Africa. And, uh, and if you're sub-Saharan Africa investing, Nigeria is definitely the country to invest. It has got the scale uh, and, and of course the problems, the scale of the problem. So I always say Pakistan is the Wall Street of problems. You know, you, if you want to go and solve a problem, you come to Pakistan. So I'm sure it's like the same for Nigeria. Um, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur and really test yourself, then the place to be is to start is either Pakistan or in Nigeria. Um, I, I think I'd go to um, uh, Hema's partner uh, in, in um, 535 Ventures, uh, Janad, Janad, do you please? Um, who's a part of Launch Africa Ventures. And Janad, you know, if you can give a bit about your own background and um, coming together with, um, with Hema and how you're building uh, this is very exciting tech venture and how do you see as a South African, uh, uh, Nigeria and investing over there, the, some of the challenges there and some of the opportunities that you face over there. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for having me this evening. It's a real pleasure. Um, I have a special link to Pakistan, actually, because my dad's best friend at university. Um, he was called Junaid, which is a popular name in Pakistan, apparently. But when he, um, when he registered my name, he forgot the spelling, so he called me Junaid. So I was intentionally supposed to be 
Um, my name's supposed to originate from Pakistan. But to be that as it may, uh, I'm Junaid. I am South African, but my uh, links to Nigeria is quite strong. Uh, my partner is Nigerian. Um, I lived in Nigeria for a, um, a period of eight years, full time, based out of Nigeria, working in West Africa. Um, I actually became an entrepreneur in Nigeria where I created my first fund um, called Abrazo Capital. This was back in 2008. Um, Abrazo Capital invested in women um, in rural areas across the African continent. The majority of those investments were in Nigeria. Um, and it was an impact fund with a large social development uh, outcomes. So we looked at uh, clean renewable energy, um, e-waste. Um, we looked at FinTech, the way at the beginning of the FinTech revolution. Um, and um, that was a very successful impact fund. We had an exit IRR of 19%, where impact funds at the time in dollar terms were returning only between four and 9%. Um, I've lived, I still own property in Nigeria, so I'm very much uh, involved in what happens to that society. Um, in 2020, we set up a fund called Launch Africa Ventures. Launch Africa is one of the most active VCs in Africa, investing at the seed stage. And even then, Nigeria is important. We've now invested in 36 Nigerian startups, um, which makes up almost 40% of our entire portfolio. Um, so we are heavily invested in the Nigerian context, uh, mainly in fintech. So we've invested in the likes of Kuda, Nabu, Payhipo, Trove, Cred Rails, Bitmama, the list is, goes on. But we also invested in other sectors like agri-tech, big data, e-tech, retail tech, and transport and logistics uh, in Nigeria. I think the biggest challenge is in Nigeria. I always say that uh, Nigerian um, entrepreneurs, by the very nature of society, where there's less dependency on governments to create jobs, Nigeria sets itself apart from other African continents by it's at the core, people are entrepreneurs, um, only because it's not only for survival, but it's also to thrive in society. Whereas in Af other African countries, you'll find that there's a lot of dependency that the government would create jobs, give uh, education. Um, that sort of dependency is less so in the Nigerian context. And what that makes for is a thriving environment for entrepreneurs. What has been the struggle is to create uh, that environment, a good and efficient environment so that entrepreneurs can thrive. Um, but there is big advancements. Nigeria recently signed the Startup Act, um, which we are all very proud of. The government are making public announcements that they would go into crypto. Um, and there's been some challenges around that because the central bond governor has still not decided what is the way that fintechs would be regulated or if there is any sort of regulation around fintechs. Um, and of, of course, the other challenge is that we need more Nigerian corporates to engage with startups. Any thriving ecosystem around the world is where there's a relay race between strong education, strong universities providing the right skills, which there are great universities in Nigeria, um, although a lot of Nigerian founders are probably internationally schooled at the moment. Um, the next thing is uh, regulation, and we're slowly seeing that wheel turn in Nigeria for the positive towards more uh, thriving environment for uh, entrepreneurs. The next thing is corporate collaboration, and I think that still needs a lot of work. Um, uh, Nigerian corporates are sort of still stuck in the traditional ways of, of working, um, and the threat of digitization is certainly at their doorsteps. But uh, we hope that they would engage more with um, startups going forward. And I, and I think the last thing is um, Nigeria is, uh, as we said, one in every six Africans are Nigerian. And so I think that there's an opportunity to bring that African talent and spread it further wide. Um, so Nigerian founders traditionally have built businesses in Nigeria 
and are not scaled so much outside of Nigeria. I totally get that, but there is a big market to explore. And certainly this is what we are trying to, to unlock as we are building a Pan-African fund. And finally, yes, uh, Nigeria produces more female tech entrepreneurs than any other country on, in, on the African continent. And this is certainly why Haim and I are now building 535, which is a female focused fund, because we need to support more female entrepreneurs. And as Hamer said, most of our portfolio will be from Nigeria. Yeah, so that's just uh, me in a nutshell. That's, uh, that's fantastic to know. And I, and I think what would be very interesting for us to know is how much you talked about corporate uh, investing or corporate participation, but how much of the local businesses, uh, local families, the established conglomerates have taken up tech investing. Because there's one thing for Silicon Valley to come and invest in Nigeria or Pakistan, but we know that they're very fickle. Whenever there are tremors back home, they keep running back to the Silicon Valley. So you need homegrown um, investing pools of money. And that often happens as it happened in India when the local business families uh, actually start taking up investing in tech in a thematic basis. So I think it will be very interesting because that has not happened to a large extent in Pakistan beyond small um, pockets here and yeah. there. Um, of, of course, one thing I would say that I think one, when, when I have spoken with people, they talk about two advantages Nigeria has. One is English. Um, so we are basically an Anglo-Saxon uh, country, a, a colonial past, but, but people say that Nigeria, the, the English is actually a much more prevalent in Nigeria. And, and what you call entrepreneurship, people say the sheer hustling power in, in Nigerians. And, and that is why, because I think most of the time the government is, I wouldn't say the enemy, but the government is the impediment. So you have to overcome the, the government uh, in your day-to-day -day life. So, and that is what entrepreneurship is to overcome obstacles. And so you're well-schooled and well-trained in, <laughs> in overcoming obstacles. So thank you very much, Janan. And it's fascinating, you've got an exotic name by um, you know, a combination from Junaid to Chanad. And at least it's, it's, a, it's a good conversation from anyone in, in South Asia, even in, in the Middle East, because Junaid is a, is, is a name which is widely, widely used over here. Um, I think with that, I would um, um, move over to Salim. Salim Hassan is based in Dubai. It's someone as, um, who has uh, traversed both Pakistan and Nigeria uh, to both introduce himself, although he has a very flamboyant and very large uh, introduction about his experience in different cultures. I think there could be a webinar about that. We'd keep it uh, uh, separate, but, but more talking about his experience with privity, uh, but also knowing Nigeria and Pakistan and investing across the two countries. Over to you, Salim Bhai. Thank you very much, Ahmed Bhai, for your kind introduction. Um, in fact, you you started off with some amazing statistics, you know, a tale of two nations and doing the comps between Nigeria and Pakistan. And I'll add two to your list, if I may. Um, now, uh, Pakistan is uh, what we call in Nigeria or a senior brother or senior sister by 13 years. Uh, Pakistan started its life in 47, Nigeria in 1960. So that's one thing. And the second, I think, important point is to realize you know, I mean, there are different statistics, but if you add Pakistan and Nigeria's populations together, believe it or not, it's bigger than the entire European Union and definitely the United States. So just keep that at the back of your minds as a, a data point. Yes, my name is Salim Hassan, and I'll just quickly run through my background, although Ahmed has touched upon it. I, the six flags that uh, actually uh, uh, summarize my background to date in life, and I run through them very quickly. I was born in the South Pacific in the Fiji Islands. My late parents came from Pakistan, though I did not grow up there. I actually grew up in Nigeria, in the northern parts of Nigeria, in Kano, Kaduna, and Sokoto. <clears throat> uh, I also went to boarding school in Nigeria from the age of eight, and if, you know, uh, and, and secondary school from the age of 11. And I think if there was any seeds of entrepreneurship that were going to be sown, on my journey in life, I think they were sewn back in Sokoto when I went to the uh, uh, a unity school called FGC Sokoto. Uh, to me, uh, anybody who's been through the Nigerian boarding school system will will uh, vouch for what I'm saying in in terms of entrepreneurial uh, uh, the seeds of entrepreneurship being sown into you in school. How to survive? How to 
you know, uh, deal, do do more with less, you know, uh, don't, I mean, you don't, we, we didn't have the luxury sometimes of, you know, running electricity or water, and you had to find ways to, you know, keep going while all those things are, people take for granted today, for example, in certain countries. But anyway, that said, I, I, I uh, left the Japanese world, did my first uh, venture in the UK 26 years ago. That's when my entrepreneurial journey started. And my second professional act in life was a company called HFC. That said, I relocated to the UAE uh, 18, 18 years ago, after two years of commuting between London and Dubai, and started a venture called Privity. Privity is a fundless sponsor, which seeks entrepreneurs globally that I want to back and build. Um, I look for two things, the quality of an entrepreneur and the underlying compelling value proposition of the idea. I've backed 16 such entrepreneurs to date in the last 13 years. Some worked out, some didn't work out. In fact, four didn't work out, three did. I've had three small exits out of the portfolio and the rest I'm still building. But when it comes to Nigeria and Pakistan, <clears throat> and this is what I see, and what I didn't share with the uh, audience is that actually I'm, I'm a student of maths. I'm like Hema said, I, she studied engineering. I actually am a failed academic at heart. I couldn't get funding for a PhD and that's when I parted ways with academia. So when I see, the maps of Pakistan and Nigeria, what I see are two homeomorphic maps. What I mean, there is congruence, the similarities between the two. And having had the benefit of being knowing both countries the way I do today, I see the opportunities there. You know, you, you're, 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 a, you're a, a, a startup in Pakistan. You can double your market size by getting the right plugs and connections with Nigeria and vice versa. The problems that exist in Pakistan exist in Nigeria as well. I mean, very, very similar. I mean, in fact, Ahmed Bai touched upon them in his introduction. You know, uh, you know, he talked about the, the government's role being that more of an impediment. We'd have the similar sort of challenges in Nigeria. So there's so many uh, parallels you can draw between both ecosystems. And what I see is the opportunity, and thanks to uh, platforms like Park, Park Launch that are reaching out to the different uh, geographies uh, in the emerging markets. I think picking on Nigeria and Pakistan and finding the, you know, the links, I mean, this platform would enable such things. You know, I, I help, you know, my portfolio companies in both markets at all times. I mean, with other markets as well, but specifically since this is covering Pakistan and Nigeria, absolutely, if there's an opportunity to take, you know, a, a, a tech, tech venture and try to scale it into Africa, you know, I'd be the first person to raise my hand and say, listen, I, I think I, I can I can help here and vice versa, you know, because at the end of the day, you 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 get you get access to a much wider audience. It could be in health tech, it could be in edu tech, it could be in agri tech. And these are both things that are synonymous to both regions. So again, I hope that gives some kind of you know background or introduction about me, what I'm doing. Um, yeah, and I'll take a pause there and pass it on to the next uh, member of the panel. Thanks. No, thank you very much, uh, Salim. And I think it's a very interesting discussion also that, you know, my experience in Pakistan is Pakistan is not one country. In fact, if you look at economically, the southern part of Pakistan, Karachi, is a very different market from Lahore. Uh, which is a very different market to northern Pakistan. In fact, I think if you operate a business in Karachi uh, and you go to Lahore and you think the same practices would work and vice versa, you will absolutely fail. I, I do run logistics business and the practices are very, very different. Um, and so, you know, the, the question that becomes is that forget about countries, let's look at cities. And is there a chance that maybe you scale a business in Karachi and Karachi may be more similar to Lagos for that matter, in terms of the operating environment and the culture, then it might be to Lahore. So there might be more proximity between, between cities in different countries than actually cities within the, those countries. So these are very interesting scale up startup strategies that instead of going into up north in the country, a, a startup could actually grow across. Uh, and I think that that could uh, uh, be experimented that could be very useful. So we can, we can certainly discuss that um, at a later point. And I think um, we are joined by Chidi, Chidi Okpala, uh, who is from Asante Financial Services. Chidi, if you would, uh, it'd be great to hear about your journey in both financing, investing, uh, both Nigeria and, and what can be learned from your experience. Over to you. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, um, Ahmad. If I'm listening to you and uh, I'm, I'm my brother, Slim. By the way, Slim is my brother, um, even though he claims Pakistani. Um, 
It's not about of you. I mean, it's so clear. I, I'm, with, I'm with you, Chidi. I'm with you. <laughs> there, are, there are far more commonalities between Nigeria and Pakistan than the differences. And it's just the, the geolocation. Um, and I, I've often told my friends that, you know, Nigeria is the, is the uh, uh, African version of, of Pakistan. And Pakistan is the, is the Asian version of Nigeria. Um, and it's quite interesting. But I think the great news is, yes, we have our own fair share of, of opportunities and, pro and challenges, but I actually see both as opportunities. Whether they're challenges or opportunities, they're all opportunities. It's, it just, um, you know, it makes me, um, you know, quite enthused about, about the future uh, and the prospects, um, uh, not only in Nigeria, but even in Pakistan. And even for us as Asante, in terms of um, future growth, uh, in, in the medium term, Pakistan is actually within within our sights. Um, but yes, I run Asante Financial Services. We are a credit-led uh, digital bank for small businesses, um, initially focused on Africa. We currently have operations in four countries, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Nigeria. Uh, we started in 2018 and, and we are powering up. Uh, prior to that, I was with Bati Airtel, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, and I was a founder and CEO of the mobile money business. Okay, nobody talks about fintech industry in Africa without starting with mobile money. Uh, so I, I built that business from the scratch, right from 2012, and, and I left in 2016. Uh, today is a very successful business. It's also a unicorn, uh, just as a corporate venture, so it's not really celebrate, celebrated as such. Uh, but before then, I was largely in banking. Um, I, I spent time with a bank called UBA, United Bank for Africa, one of the largest Pan-African banks. And I ran their retail banking business across 19 countries. And that helped me to have a very good view um, and experience, hands-on experience of, of, of the continent. Uh, but in between my stay in UBA, um, I, I spent time with Accenture. Uh, and it was at Accenture that I got into venturing. And most of the, most of the venturing work within Accenture was corporate venturing. Um, and so we worked with quite a number of our clients. And today I would say, you know, some of the, 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 the firms that have become the, the, the core foundation uh, for what you call the fintech industry, not only in Nigeria, uh, but in West Africa and to some extent in Africa, um, I was part of the team that actually built uh, those firms. So companies like InterSwitch, uh, that, that, uh, that, that people celebrate today. I was part of it. Uh, unified Payments uh, in Nigeria. Uh, I was part of it. E-Transact. Uh, I was also part of it. Um, we also had the ones that failed, okay? Like they, they went an ATM consortium called ATMC. Uh, it's no more. Uh, and, and a couple of others. So we had our own fair share of, of, of um, successes and, and, and of mistakes uh, as well. And then coming back to, to Pakistan and, and, uh, and Nigeria, you know, I believe so much in predictable patterns. And um, I, I always look at, um, you know, there are, there are, you know, there are markets that have similarities, okay, in terms of you know, diversity of the people, in terms of um, even religion in some extent, uh, in terms of uh, population, uh, just that by by either luck or you know when they became independent from their you know former colonial masters and so on and so forth, they've been able to you know be in, in, in some ways ahead of some other countries. And so we look at Nigeria and Pakistan, um, then you look at countries like India and Brazil. Uh, we share quite a lot of commonalities. Just that those countries, from a venturing point of view, they are probably, you can argue, depending on the perspective or depending on the area, between five and 10 years ahead, okay? And so that, that sort of reinforces uh, the, the, the enthusiasm about, the, about those markets and, and the opportunities that look, uh, provided things you know, work well and are guided you know, properly, uh, Nigeria and Pakistan can actually be like India and perhaps like Brazil in the coming couple in the coming couple of years, uh, which is quite kind of interesting. So thanks again, and 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 I'm, I'm delighted to be on this platform. 
Excellent. And, and uh, I think, uh, Chidi, I had the privilege and the honor of meeting Mr. Tony uh, Elumilu. Um, I think he was uh, the founder of uh, UBA, United Bank of Africa. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I, I met him, I, I was, I met him in, in Boston when I was there. And what a, what a fan, fantastic story and, and an impressive person. And actually what was happening was, and this is a bit Nigeria-Pakistan story, I had created something called Pakistan Fast Growth 500, which is a ranking of SMEs. Now I'm talking about this is 2010, 11, 12, when venture yeah. was not that sexy, was not that yeah. well known. Sure. And, so, sure. and so there was a parallel that was Nigeria Fast Growth 50, an initiative that was launched. And this started from Harvard University. And, and so, you know, the Pakistan and Nigeria was always competing in terms of who's going to be the fastest growing <laughs> ranking. And, and so, and, so I'm, and, and you know, the founders who were Americans, when they went to Nigeria and they were saying, oh, I'm actually going to go to Pakistan and I love Pakistan. They say, oh, are you going to Pakistan? Is it not dangerous? Is it not this? Is it not that? And then when she would come to Pakistan, and, and tell them, though, I have to go to Nigeria. And Pakistan say, oh, my God, are you going to Nigeria? It's not dangerous. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <make wild>. it. <laughs> so, so, so there's a lot of mutual and not understanding each other. And, and I thought that was quite interesting because we were thinking you guys are, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's more risky. And, 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 and you guys were thinking that we were more risky. So clearly there needs to be some bridges that need to be built. So, uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for your very yes. interesting uh, background. And I think uh, if Africa has to leapfrog. I think it has to be through digital platform and digital money, and it has uh, to a large extent. I think Africa is something in terms of case studies, it's not something that even Asia and even India and Pakistan um, can copy from in terms of the digital money revolution that has be, happened in Nigeria, in Kenya, and other parts of, in parts of Africa. A bit more, uh, I'd like to bring in a, uh, I would imagine, Pakistani from Ahmed Javed, who's the founder of Kasuku. Uh, so, Ahmed, uh, tell us about your entrepreneurial journey and Kasuku and uh, about both Nigeria and Pakistan Corridor and how has, uh, you know, well, what do you think of the future of investing and learning from, from each other? Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ahmed. And uh, nice, to, nice to meet uh, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, uh, I actually grew up in Pakistan and uh, I have an engineering degree that I took from Pakistan and uh, worked in the telecom sector for a few years. And uh, I have had the opportunity to move to uh, UK uh, quite early in my career uh, as an engineer. And then um, straight from there, um, around 2010, I got an opportunity to, uh, to move to San Francisco Bay Area. And I got involved with uh, Nokia uh, doing startups. Uh, and uh, around that time, um, Apple iPhone came out and Nokia started to have their troubles. Uh, and in 2012, 2013, um, I managed to spin off a piece of uh, IP from Nokia and was able to set up my first venture. So that was my first um, um, entrepreneurial activity uh, out of the corporate, which was Nokia. Um, and I was, um, and I moved back to UK where my family was. Uh, and here I was with a piece of IP uh, and no staff, no employees. It was just myself and another co-founder uh, and I, I knew no one in the UK who to go to seek funding and so on. Uh, so interesting circumstances uh, that we started that first company. Uh, and believe it or not, in next four years, uh, we exited out of that company with $2 million in profit. Uh, and that happened through, um, through MTN, one of the telcos. So interesting circumstances led to the led to our entry in Africa where we actually found a customer instead of an investor. Uh, and through MTN, which is uh, a bit like Vodafone or at and for US or European folks, um, through, uh, through them, we managed to um, uh, basically um, deploy our technology to about 17 countries in Africa. Uh, and Nigeria was one of them. Uh, and I was very, and I was at this at that time. I was still in the UK, um, and I've been, I've traveled to few African countries, not Nigeria, uh, 
And I was quite, uh, when I was looking at the data, me and my co-founder, we were quite uh, um, perplexed by the fact that some of the smaller countries in Africa, places like Ivory Coast or Benin or uh, West African markets were doing so much better in terms of revenue than Nigeria. Uh, and that made me travel to Nigeria and, uh, and then to realize uh, like, you know, what's going wrong. Uh, and that was 2018. And when I actually went to Nigeria, uh, this is when we, uh, we, start, we come up with the idea of Kazuku. Uh, and we realized that it's such a massive opportunity uh, that that would doff our other business going on at the moment. Um, and, uh, and basically things like payment platforms were becoming better, accessible. And so we actually registered a telecom operator in Nigeria that we are running today, which is called Kazuku. And uh, in fact, uh, some, some um, uh, obviously we're working with Janaid, uh, Launch Africa, um, one of their funds has invested in Kazuku. And funny enough, um, even, even at a smaller scale, but we are now at a position where that African company, Kazuku, we're now selling this technology in the UK. Even we have some clients in the US. Uh, of course, South Africa is one of them as well. So now that African company has becoming more like a, more like a, almost like a global venture, but coming out of Africa. Some people ask me about why, why do you not take this to Pakistan? Uh, which obviously is very um, sort of uh, interesting for this, uh, uh, for this um, session that we're having with Nigeria-Pakistan uh, corridor. Um, and, uh, but, and that always comes to my mind because being Pakistani, that's my first reaction. Let's just do something in Pakistan. And something, sometimes when I meet my Pakistani friends, they're like, why are you not doing this in Pakistan? So, um, but yeah, really happy to be here, everyone. Um, I'm pure, I'm an entrepreneur. So uh, if anyone has any question, anything I can add, um, I completely agree with the panelists uh, that both countries uh, offer incredible opportunities. Uh, I think the other thing I would say is that uh, both companies also, countries also, uh, like, our, like with our journey, um, I would encourage um, entrepreneurs here to, to think global. You know, with such immense uh, talent, obviously we are solving the local challenges, but there's nothing stopping us from going ab above and beyond. Uh, especially with the diaspora as well, there's a commonality there. There's a massive uh, diaspora, Pakistani diaspora outside Pakistan, and same goes for Nigeria. So these offer some unique opportunities to tap American, for example, North American markets or European markets. Uh, which is quite exciting, especially in this time when we are all a little bit challenged uh, with access to, to money and so on. Uh, so yeah, this is a little bit about my journey and really nice to be here, guys. Uh, just don't be shy. Anything I can help in any way, shape or form to anyone here would love to be, would love to do that. <laughs> I think that's I think that's fantastic, and Amar, I think next time I, I would suggest to Ali that um, you're here in Karachi or Lahore, the local uh, Park Lock chapter can host you. I think it'd be fascinating to know about your experience journey in Nigeria. I think we all know about what's happening in the US, but very little about Nigeria. And I think you have both hands-on grounds experience of it. It's a big market um, for us to know. So I think you definitely should contact and, and we should definitely host you for that. And, oh, and it's a fascinating journey and it's all, all Nigerian born or, or like Asian and Nigerian born and selling it to UK and selling it to the USA. It's an exact success story that we want to see. Um, with that, I, I invite um, uh, Mariam, Mariam Logan, who is the founder of Blue Sapphire Hub. My Mariam, and thank you very much for waiting. Last but not least, if you can... Um, you know, introduce yourself and the work that you've done and what you've learned in the process about investing in, in Nigeria or growing businesses in Nigeria. And I think that'd be very helpful. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, good evening and good afternoon, everyone. So uh, nice to meet you all. Um, <laughs> I actually, you, it's really um, nice that the way you evolved the whole thing. I really started First, and then the guys, and then we now close it with me. So it's really <laughs> nice the way you are in the whole thing. Um, so um, I would start by saying my name is Mariam Lawan, and I am I am an Niger I'm an Nigerian. 
and uh, born and bred here. And actually, um, so I founded a Blue Sapphire Hub uh, in the in the year 2014. Actually, I didn't have any experience working anywhere else. Actually, it was just me and um, me uh, seeing a problem in the community and starting up Blue Sapphire. So um, along the line, yes, um, when I started, it was just um, it was just me seeing that a lot of um, when it, when I was in university, a lot of uh, people that are, that come from Nigeria because I studied abroad, okay, um, are seen away from the core IT because that was software engineering. A lot of them were seen away from it. They were saying that okay, if you join this course, definitely the programming course will take you away. So that was like so immediately when I enrolled, that was what people kept telling me that okay, even the guys couldn't make it. So you should, it's better for you to that just. Uh, change your course and go for BIS, business information system, that would like suit you better. And I took that as a challenge actually and said, okay, I have to, I have to use this course. That was how I studied software engineering in the university. And at that time I was the only Nigerian girl there. So when I come back to Nigeria, I was like, okay, what's real I during my university, I was studying like what what was really the problem. Then I realized that it's mostly about the skills and talent that was missing. And that was that motivated me to say, okay, when I come back to Nigeria, I'm going to do something about it. And with that, I I founded Blue Stuff. I hope it started with just a program in a. Um, hello. Oh, sorry, the network went off, and then I came back now. Can you all hear me? I'm sorry. Okay, it's so, a very typical um, emerging markets problem. Don't worry about it. It happens to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So actually, um, so actually, that was really what um, motivated me to start um, Blue Sapphire Hub. And um, along the line, we kept on building capacity, training people on how they can um, uh, they can be technologically skilled, learning programming, and all. And um, Along the line, we have built so much uh, talent that we realized that, okay, what are we going to do with this talent? Because coming from Northern Nigeria, it's not as, it's not as, um, it's not as it is in Lagos that you have vast opportunities to uh, launch startups. So that was how we started supporting this um, uh, talent to create um, innovation-driven enterprises. And we started providing them with uh, business development support, guiding them and also connecting them with opportunities across the country to move from the North to the, to Lagos and be able to access investment opportunities. We started um, uh, getting them to have, um, to uh, build ideas from that um, uh, gr ground up approach. That was how we started it. And along the line, we have learned uh, so many uh, issues that we see. So basically, um, Blue Sapphire is operates in Northern Nigeria and we have understood the challenges that um, are happening within the region. We have talent, we have skills, we have, the, the region has about, um, uh, the 35% of the population in the region are youth, and uh, these youth are below 18 years. And they ha and but uh, unfortunately, the talent are not uh, are not uh, participating in tech industry. So and with that, that was opportunity we see there, and that was how we started building the capacity to meet up to the industry standard and push them out to be able to access uh, those opportunities. So and um, uh, along the line, we have seen a lot of um, um, uh, interesting and engaging startups that come from that region. That is how uh, the best AI uh, solution for JITEX came out from the region. Uh, and this is out of the initiatives of various tech innovation hubs and also ecosystem building programs that help them to uh, bring out that unique capacity to come up with those solutions. We have seen um, now how um, uh, also in this uh, year's JITEX that uh, a Nigerian startup uh, from Northern Nigeria that Sharp Sharp also was able to uh, be the best log logistics and mobility uh, solution. So actually, um, these are the things that, okay, these are all the efforts of how the innovation hub and how the business development support that we have been providing in the region together with other uh, stakeholders in the region has been able to ignite the capacity of the youth in the region and make some people for them to uh, uh, bring out the inner capacity and idea and come up with those innovation driven enterprises. So this is all generally about me and how I've been uh, supporting young people and women to be able to build invest in investable and sustainable ventures. 
Excellent. I think one of the, the, and that's a fantastic contribution, building the tech ecosystem is very important. And so of course, is building the, you know, the backbone infrastructure of it. And, and I think one of the things that I feel um, is a big constraint in Pakistan, what I'd say, is uh, having the right talent at scale, the quality talent at scale. You know, it's easy to hire 20, B, 20 software um, engineers or 50 software engineers, but if I have to hire 500 software engineers or thousands of engineers, it's, it's not that easy. Uh, and I think anything that both in terms of, of building the HR capability or the whole ecosystem, I think that uh, that is very, very helpful and that help create the next unicorns. Um, I think we, we've, we've had such a fascinating discussion that we've already spent 50 minutes uh, of the time. And so, um, you know, there are questions, some of the questions that are coming, uh, from the audience, so please keep those coming through, and and we will uh, address that because we've got very limited short, uh, short period of time. Um, but I think one thing I would ask the audience, and if anyone volunteers to go for that, and then we'll revert to the uh, question from the audience, um, is that if you think of one way we can get more engagement between Nigerian and Pakistani um, tech companies or, or, or startups. Or, or, or with the venture, what would it be? What are the platforms? What are the ways one could go about doing it? Because there's not enough happening. Um, and, and I think instead of focusing on say, I always say on the West, one should focus on countries like Egypt or Turkey or Nigeria, uh, which have got scale and similarity and to go there or to connect with tech um, uh, the venture uh, in those countries. So anyone who's got any ideas from our panel, esteemed panel, please go to share that so that we, uh, you know, we can connect with each other, collaborate, and then grow our businesses or grow the pool of capital that comes to the both countries. Uh, Salim, hi, I'd ask you to, if you can start since you're sitting somewhere in the middle in the Dubai, uh, and you can probably comment on both. Um, but well, anyone else, Ahmed or um, Chini, yes. if you want to comment after that. No, well, I mean, I think that was one of the reasons why I chose Dubai, having uh, made the move 18 years ago, because there are very few geographies that I've operated out of where you can cover the entire world on the same business day without compromising on your sleep. And Dubai, UAE was certainly one geography which had, you know, infrastructure that worked, you know, um, security. Um, there, there are lo lots of factors when you want to build a thriving ecosystem you know if you if you look back and how various um you know from silicon valley which is the granddaddy of all the ecosystems to israel to korea to japan if, how did these you know ecosystems uh unfold over the years there was something called the trihelic structure which was <clears throat> where three institutions came together, the public sector, the private sector, and academia, they came together. And then it morphed into the Pentagon structure, which was the public, private academia, uh, entrepreneurs, and the venture capitalists. This is now morphing into the hexagon structure. <clears throat> so what is that last point on the, on, on, on the polygon that actually is important? And that is the quality of life and standard of living especially when you want to attract people to come and be part of that ecosystem. And this is very, very important. Now, <clears throat> um, there are some geographies that would be very challenged to attract people to come, however exciting it might be. That said, the counter argument to that is, well, you know, 200 million people cannot all be wrong. You know, they all exist. They all you find ways to go through the day-to-day -day challenges, be it in Pakistan or in Nigeria. So that no longer is an argument that, you know, uh, uh, for me makes any sense. But from the positioning of Dubai right now, having access to both, you know, uh, direct access to both Pakistan and Nigeria, it lends itself to forming uh, a very interesting bridge. I certainly, in my own individual capacity, uh, you know, whether it's uh, 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 entrepreneurs in my portfolio or those that reach out to me, if I can assist them and, you know, guide them into different markets, you know, vice versa, I'm the first person to encourage osmosis between those two countries. I mean, because to me, that's one way of expanding and, you know, in increasing your reach. Now, I think I think the, the, the thing to really drive home here is let's 
it, it starts off with the entrepreneur. You know, obviously you're all looking for capital and stuff. Absolutely, that is that is you know first and foremost on every entrepreneur's mind. But more more than an investor, with all due respect to all the VCs in the world, including myself. I think the more important valuable relationship for any entrepreneur is your customer. You get a repeat customer, honestly, you don't even need a, uh, an investor at the end of the day. Why do I say that? <clears throat> and that is, so if you, let, let's take specific uh, examples with Pakistan. Any entrepreneur sitting out with an idea, if you find you've got your first few customers in Pakistan embracing it, let's see if we can find similar customers in Nigeria that could benefit with the tech that you're rolling out there. You get one or two customers in Nigeria that show promise, you sign them up. I'm sure the Janades and Hemmers of this world will be jumping over you because you know now you're coming into their turf and showing ab 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 absolute traction for them, right? So it's all about discovery and you know proving yourself that you can actually work in other geographies. Because I mean, at the end of the day, technology trans transcends color, creed, religion, race. It doesn't matter where it is. If it works here, it should also work. And the, and the best way to prove to an investor that it does work is show you have a paying customer in that other geography. And then slowly but surely, and the same thing with a Nigerian entrepreneur. Let's see if we can find something, you know, you, it works in Nigeria. Let's see if we can find a counterpart or a customer in Pakistan and vice versa. And I think that would be a nice way to start off. So I'll Take a pause there, yeah. and, you know. Let other panelists uh, share their thoughts and on this. Uh, two question. things. So two things. I think uh, set yourself in Dubai, which is a lot of Pakistani startups are doing, including Abi has based itself in Abu Dhabi, and also approach uh, Salim Bhai um, if you have to go across uh, the Indian Ocean to Nigeria. So that's that's the two things um, you want to do um, that one should do. Uh, I think I um, uh, Ahmad I can see is uh, typing away. Sorry. Uh, to, uh, yes. Uh, to explain some of these ideas that you sure for the for the benefit of the audience. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I was just sharing some ideas that uh, I mean, all of us know that uh, getting investments uh, is 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 not going to be a very let's say great year, uh, twenty twenty three by all indications. So startups out there need to look out for uh, for selling opportunities, partnership opportunities. Um, and I think the two things that can exist in these in our markets, both Nigeria and Pakistan are very price sensitive markets, right? Uh, if I have to sell something in Nigeria uh, and I'm making this in US or Europe, uh, you know, selling this in Nigeria is a massive challenge or Pakistan, right? Um, so therefore, I think this gives Pakistani startups an edge and vice versa. So it's not all bad sides. I think operating in these lower cost markets give the startups the strategic edge, right? Uh, and you should um, look out to benefit from it. Um, I don't know one example that was coming to my mind, by the way, Nadra, the Pakistani identity organization has been rolling out identity services at scale. Uh, personally, telecom operators uh, in Nigeria have been benefiting from some telecom tech coming out of Pakistan. Uh, also, business process outsourcing is growing in Nigeria. So, guys, I mean, if you need to provide support, call centers, very good opportunity exists in Nigeria for that. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are definitely, I would say, revenue generation partnerships is key. Um, and... Uh, you know, incoming climate, uh, as opposed to just try and raise out investments. So be creative, um, and developers. I think uh, one thing that is uh, that is great that I've noticed. Obviously, Pakistan has been uh, producing some software developers, uh, but Nigeria has really stepped up the game, guys. So if you need developers for projects that can make you money. Check out some awesome um, Nigerian developers, awesome artists, brand brand manager, social media influencers, and you will get great price uh, for these services. So just look out. Excellent. Thank you very much for the point about Nadra. I think Nadra has done a lot of integration and systems mm -hmm. in uh, in some of the African countries. So I think that's an interesting area um, uh, of collaboration. Um, so. Um, 
uh, Chidi, if I may ask you one of the questions that have is that what are the key sectors can these two? Chidi, do you want to proceed? I think the answer or the question was about uh, opportunities. Thank yeah. You, Emma, this, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the challenge from Amar's side, right? Not no my side. Okay. Yes, what, yes. Your question? side looks good. Yes. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Look, I think, uh, and that's the beauty of, of, of both markets. I mean, I speak, uh, you know, so confidently about Nigeria and, and some, I mean, from my little leg of Pakistan, I, I can imagine it's about, about the same thing. So, so I, opportunities are, you know, nearly everywhere. And, and a lot of that speak to the, what I call the, the voids uh, in, in both markets. Okay. I mean, one very clear one is the retail, okay? So if you come to a market like Nigeria, organized retail penetration is less than 1%, okay? We don't find, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the big name, the organized, you know, maybe you get into a market like Dubai, like your Carrefour, um, and, and, you know, so those big structured organized retail, Yes, they are there, uh, but it's only the, the top 1% of the top 1% that actually go there. And they're only in the big cities, okay? Uh, so their penetration is less than 1%. The, the average Nigerian, when they want to shop, whether it's groceries or clothing or whatever they want to do, they go to the market, the street markets. And that's actually where they go. And there's a huge opportunity around uh, using technology to not change the shape of those markets, but but to give them better exposure, exposure, bring some some structure, some form, and, and help them to be able to scale um, a little more efficient. Okay, and also take away cash because cash is quite limited. And there's an attempt, you know, with you know quick you know quick commerce and all of that, but it's not yet there. But but there is. Uh, immense opportunity in that in that space, um, and, and I can also speak for for Pakistan as well, uh, from, from what I know. The second area, naturally, is financial services. Um, mm. If you look at if you look at Nigeria, um, access to formal financial services is still about fifty percent of Nigerians. If you look at banking as an example, um, Nigeria has what they call the BVN biometric verification number, okay? Which is pretty sophisticated. And I, I do tell people, I live in Dubai as well. So I, I, I tell them the, the, the banking, in, the financial services industry in Nigeria is far more, probably close to 10 years ahead of what you find in the UAE. And that's true. Um, so, so with a BVN, every bank account holder has full identification, the fingerprints, the iris and all of that. And for a market that has in excess of 200 million people, that database only has about 60 million. So that gives you a fair idea of the sort of opportunity we have. And, and if you dig deeper into financial services, retail credit penetration in Nigeria as a percentage of industry credits is still less than 10%. So most of the credit by banks are actually going to the large corporates like Dangote, MTN, that you know, mm -hmm and the mm. public sector, okay? Um, just to take it further as well, credit cards in Nigeria are less than 100,000. In any case, credit cards will never happen in Nigeria anymore, <laughs> okay? So, so we've sort of leapfrogged credit card. It's not gonna happen. Same as mortgage penetration, super tiny. So there is, there is, there is immense opportunity for financial services. It's not even a case of disruption. There's nothing to disrupt because it's not existing. It's just about building it, okay? in a way and manner that fits where the market is today. Um, the, the other area um, is healthcare. I mean, and we all know this, okay? Um, organized, structured, formal healthcare um, eludes most Nigerians, okay? The government hospitals are just not functioning. The private hospitals are overpriced. And so there's just a huge gap <coughs> when it comes to quality healthcare. It, it just does not exist. There's been a few attempts by some health tech firms, but none has actually achieved scale. And then the other area that I'll just call out uh, um, before I wrap up is insurance, okay? Insurance penetration just does not exist. Nobody 
<laughs> Nobody owns insurance in Nigeria, okay? Whatever the form. The only insurance that is pervasive in Nigeria is third party motor vehicle insurance. And the reason is because it is mandatory by law. And if you drive your car without any form of insurance, uh, you'll be arrested by the cops. And so that's why people do that, okay? Outside of that, nobody else buys insurance. We just, you know, we trust God. Um, and, and, and God has also been helpful and merciful, okay? And keeping us safe. So that's also one other area uh, that a lot has to be done. But, but finally is, uh, and, and this is the gospel I keep preaching. Uh, and one of the fundamental, um, um, I call it an infrastructural item, that can actually fast track the takeoff of takeoff of most of, most of these opportunities that I talked about is smartphone penetration. Mm -hmm. So today in Nigeria, smartphone penetration is about forty five percent. And so you look at an MTN that has about seventy five million subscribers, uh, Airtel about forty five, Globalcom about forty. Um, the 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 percentage of their customer base uh, or subscribers that have smartphones is just about between between forty and forty five percent. And if only we can move from 45 to 65, which is where South Africa is today, uh, that leap alone will require additional 50 to 60 million smartphones. And by the time these Nigerians actually have uh, the smartphones, it, it becomes a lot easier um, you know, for, for, for founders and, 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 and startups to be able to build solutions uh, that can leverage these smartphones as a UI or UX, as the case may be, uh, to be able to distribute and create, you know, um, um, experiences uh, that customers will actually fancy and stay and, and, and continue to use. Uh, and it's happening, okay? Because mm -hmm. again, the telcos have invested massively in 4G and now 5G. I'm seeing as well as 5G in the market. And what they're looking for, they're looking for people to digest and consume, mm. to consume and digest uh, this data. And without smartphones, it's not going to happen. Uh, and so there's concerted effort um, by, by you know telcos and financial service providers like Asante, you know, providing affordable credits, and even the government uh, towards making it easy and seamless uh, for the average consumer right. to be able to uh, the smartphones. Yeah. So, so it's a case of opportunities, Gallo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, great. I, th I think uh, um, I, I actually I just want to point out that we have got with us Nasir Akhtar. Nasir is the founder of Infotech. Infotech is actually a very successful software company, and they make software that powers the stock exchanges. And I think Nasir has been very successful in actually marketing and 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 implementing the, that software in Africa. Nasir Akhtar is. is they are definitely someone who um, was a founder of Infotech and a friend, but also a very successful founder. And I think he's found a lot, a lot of success in doing so in selling uh, software, uh, large scale stock exchange management software in Africa. So uh, thank you, Nasir, for joining us. And hopefully, things that there are. Um, we've really, really run out of time um, on this. And so I would. Start with them, but others please do chime in. Uh, Flutter wave in Nigerian A left in Pakistan there. If you can, yes. Okay. Hello, the network was a bit jittery, so I didn't get the question. Please, can you repeat it again? Uh, so, so Flutter wave in Africa, in Nigeria, and um, an A left in Pakistan. A left was a, a quick commerce company that that. Um, uh, that Anxiety. Hello. They are managed. Um, can you hear me? Um, uh, anyone else can join in? I can 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 answer to that question. Ahmed or Salim Hai, um, if you can can answer that question. Hello. Hello. Sorry, Ahmed. I I I didn't hear you clearly. Uh, as Mariam said, the the internet was jittery. I lost the first 70, 80% of what you were trying to argue. I heard flutter wave and then I heard yes. something. I, I lost, I wasn't sure. You were, you were drawing titles between two uh, Yes, so there, 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 can you hear me? There is a question yes. in the chat. You can read yes. it from there. It says flutter wave in Nigeria and A left in yes. Pakistan had brought yes. major concerns about tech 
startup governance. How do you overcome this perception issue about the risk associated with with tech governance in both Pakistan and in Nigeria? That's the question. I see. Look, um, I, I, I'll take a, a, a very top view of uh, when it comes to governance and you know putting these things. I think I think first and foremost we have to address the basic underlying, I think which is probably the most difficult thing if you ask me in the 18 years that I've been looking at venture investing and looking at early stage stuff, um, everything you can figure out, I mean, you can understand an idea, you can understand the tech stack, you can understand you know, the patents around the technology, but the one thing, the one thing that I still have a challenge within 18 years is attaching a value to the integrity of the entrepreneur, all right? There's no art to find the mind's construction from the face. And therein lies the fundamental problem in this. And nine out of 10 times when, you know, I mean, we can, markets, yes, play their uh, fair, can take their toll, you know, good times, all boats rise with the tide and in the tough times, you know, things adjust. But where the integrity is lacking and that ties in then with governance and risk and compliance, et cetera, et cetera, there's, there's very little you can do. There's very little you can do. I mean, I'm yet to find a foolproof way of figuring out or sussing out the integrity. And that you can only learn in the course of your journey. Yes, the company should have their you know, their, their back office or their kitchens in order. Their book should be kept properly. Now, if if there's an entrepreneur whose integrity is, is not up to the mark, then problems will occur. And in the case of Flutter Wave, from what I've read in the public domain, and in the case of Alift, from what I've read in the public domain, these two things were, were questioned. So again, that's that's how I will uh, uh, answer your question. I don't know if I fully addressed it, but I, I'm I'm going to the root cause. You know, uh, what what I have challenges with today, and usually I find that is the case because where there's malafide, uh, you know, in 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 an enterprise, whether it's small or big, you know, the the house will fall down. Excellent. It's of course somebody said that the real art in venture investing or private equity is. Two, two things, two cents, sense the smell of the founder, the integrity of the founder, as you said, and the sense of the deal. The... Well, well, I mean, it's funny you say that, uh, uh, Ahmed. I mean, 18 years ago when I founded Privity, and people can, you know, verify that in two seconds by, that, by just typing up privityllle.com and going to about us. The first two sentences... I wrote this 18 years ago. I say I care about two things, the quality of the entrepreneur and the underlying compelling value proposition of the idea. This is my starting off point. Yet today, where I fall down, which is outside my control, is if, the, if I made a bad judgment call on the entrepreneur I, and, and it stems from the integrity. I can only vouch for my own integrity, nobody else's. And that, therein lies the challenge. However, I mean, however big or small you are in business, where integrity is no, it does not exist. I mean, you're wasting your time. What are you doing? You can raise all the money in the world. And I don't have to tell you, I mean, read the press and see the type of things you hear. It's always integrity. And, and then of course, it's human nature that kicks in fear and greed or hubris or ego or a combination of factors. And I can go on and on about them, you know, uh, wax lyrical about these things. But the reality is that's where these problems stem from. Does that answer your question, Ahmed? I mean, I, uh, I don't know if I have or, but that's the same with Influtterware. I mean, it doesn't matter which, which company you pick. It's people behind it. Yes. You know, um, but be it yeah. in Pakistan or Nigeria. Yeah, you know? I, I, I agree. Yes, uh, Salim, I agree, totally agree with you. And, uh, and also like from the founder's perspective for those founders who are here, guys, don't bother. Why, why, what's the need for justifying? right? That's the, that's exactly the game, right? So there has to be failures uh, as part of this whole thing. So don't bother with these, these type of questions. I would say, keep doing what you're doing uh, and look forward. Also challenge your own startups, you know, um, challenge to, to find out weaknesses in your own story. And if you start, 
if your startup is investment worthy, it will be invested. Uh, I don't think uh, so. Don't don't bother trying to justify what happened there. What happened there? Startups fail everywhere, including yeah. US, and all sorts of things happen. So don't don't think think twice about so, it. So so I I will add a little bit more to what you're saying, uh, Amir, and that is, uh, especially entrepreneurs. I mean, regardless of the macro environment, that is something you cannot preempt, predict, nor can you control. If interest rates are going up and that's when you're starting a business, well, you have to deal in that environment. If you're in a you know, loose monetary policy environment, that's the environment you've got to deal with. However, what is in your hand is to focus on building a resilient business, which, 100%. Means, your, which means your customer is there today, tomorrow, day after. And that's what you've got to focus on. Make sure that you are there in the game today, tomorrow, day after. And if you can build a business that thrives in a very challenging environment because it's resilient, well, guess what? When the next bull wave comes up, well, you will just soar beyond your wildest dreams. So that's, that is one thing I would say. And the second thing I would say and that is for entrepreneurs who feel sometimes disheartened, you know, going knocking on tons of VC doors and getting rejection after rejection after rejection. I will quote the uh, words of a famous, because we're talking about Nigeria and Pakistan, I will for, quote the uh, famous words of a gentleman, uh, the late Stephen Keshi, who was the former coach of the Nigerian football team. And since we're in the FIFA environment, it's probably an apt analogy to take. Uh, and he said, and I quote, and it's actually one of my mantras today. He said, I don't need you to believe in me to succeed. I will work hard. And when I succeed, you will believe. And, I, and this is a message I, I tell to every single entrepreneur who's listening out there right now. Just focus on building something. Keep focusing on it. Hard work, grit, determination. Resist. This is your toolkit. There's no shortcut. You know, the, the road on venture is not for the faint hearted. If you want a quick fix overnight, unicorn flash, I'm sorry, that's not the language I understand. You have to be at it, build something that you're there. And when people see that you're there day in, day out, sooner or later, well, guess what? They'll knock on your door. You know, I mean, right. let's just see that. Anyway. Those are some of my 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 Excellent. my my, my thinking, and that, that led to a very passionate because I think uh, discussion because we do as brothers uh, face uh, you know perception issue uh, which is that that you know by by chance the distribution of such issue of such uh, you know tech venture failure might not be more than it would happen in let's say North America or Europe. But just because of the perception issue, it is more amplified in cases like India, uh, in Pakistan, or in, uh, in Nigeria. And I think it's um, more sensitive as a result of that. Um, I think it's, uh, um, uh, and we've, uh, as I said, we've, uh, 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 Ali, please. I think we just, we had uh, Onyaka joined in yes. from Creeps. Yes. Um, I yes, think See, I, I saw that. Please, uh, Onyaka, uh, if you can, thank you very much for joining uh, this uh, panel um, on Nigeria and Pakistan. And we've had, you know, discussion around how the two countries are very similar in a way. And I think Nigeria, though further ahead in tech venture development, um, having raised more money. Uh, but what you are doing as a, as a founder of a mobility company, we have, um, we have a similar company in Pakistan, Easy Bikes, I, I believe. Uh, and it would be very interesting to know your own journey and, and you know, how would you see Pakistan as an opportunity um, if you're solving a problem in Nigeria, a real problem in Pakistan, then you, it would probably overlap in Pakistan and you could solve the same problem over here. Over to you. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Ahmed. Um, thanks for having me. Um, just speaking about trips, I mean, you talked about my journey. Um, so I, I have a background in software engineering, um, worked for a couple of corporates, uh, Deloitte British Council, and then worked for a couple of startups, um, Elion, Okanao, Jumian, which was maybe Africa's first unicorn in the early days. Um, I was staff number one there, uh, worked for a couple of uh, other startups before launching mine. Um, 
In the process of doing this, I have been able to exit two startups and I failed, I failed in maybe three, um, exited two, and I'm currently running one while co-founding two others out there. Now, coming straight into trips, um, in the last three years, we've found ourselves in a place where we build a solution for problems for most Africans. And I think it's also a problem you see in Pakistan. And I know of I know of a startup that was solving our problem in Pakistan and recently just um, exit the market and the the and that's Swivel. And um the, I think the country manager there decided that this is too big a problem to just exit the market and leave. And she's gone ahead to launch um, a similar startup in the market raised, I think, half a million dollars um, recently um, to solve the problem. Now, focusing on trips, it's we created an app to help people to move from bus stops to bus stop or city to city um, across Nigeria. Um, but very quickly, we've expanded into two more, two more countries, um, Uganda and Ghana, after acquiring two startups. Um, we acquired one in Uganda and acquired one in, in, in Ghana. Um, to expand into those markets. Yeah, so um, that's, uh, over the period, we've moved over 2 million Africans at that time. And um, we we continue to keep our eyes on the opportunity to expand into more markets. But I think our focus for us is, is the African uh, market, um, pretty much keeping our eyes on, on African focused, um, the African focused market before we look at other markets. And I think the best way for us to expand has always been from a place where we collaborate with people that already understand the market, as against us going into those markets to do things from the scratch, from inception. Um, our expansion strategy has sat around acquisition deals. And for acquisitions to happen, um, it's pretty much building relationship with entrepreneurs that have um, similar um, vision or similar passion for the problems we are, we are creating solutions for. And so that has led into those expansions across um, Africa. We can really pay attention to Pakistan and what is in that market. Um, I, I think yeah, Asia as a whole, right? just Pakistan and India, especially India, where I I did my university degree in, um, in Sikkim, Malibu. So I have my eyes very, very focused on the um, Indian-Pakistan market. Um, but what we've said to ourselves is first, win Africa before we go into um, any other region. We want to be number one on the continent. We want to lead in this space um, in the continent, and then we look at new markets. So that's a bit of background on, on us and, and on trips. I'm sorry, I, I joined the call a bit later. I think it was time difference for me. I thought I was six, uh, it was a different time that I joined and where I am at the moment, but I'm happy to contribute for that. Thanks, Ahmed. Well, thank you very much for, and, and, hope, uh, and great to know about the acquisitions that you're doing, because I do think at this time, uh, you know, uh, there will be much more instead of fundraising, there'll be a lot more acquisitions or fundraise through acquisitions. I think that's going to be definitely the case. And, and there is a there is a case for, uh, for for conquering your local market first before going to another country, um, you know, rather than just trying to go and conquer another market first, be very strong in your in your home market. I think we've been uh, very blessed with having a very interesting and insightful debate and have uh, lots of people uh, join us and thank you very much. It's uh, we we're supposed to be one hour long and it's gone up to one and a half hour and we've still got 40 people uh, tuned in. I think I'd li uh, like to finish by offering all my panelists like the one thought about, um, you know, um, uh, about Nigeria or Pakistan and what we can learn with each other and what how we can collaborate for greater success of the people. I think the sheer, um, you know, hope and expectation of the tech as being a transformation agent in both countries is quite important and quite important factor and how all of us or, or people who are founders in tech uh, and venture investors can play a role in that. Uh, so I invite all of my panelists to start with Mariam, but since I ended with you, uh, with your talk, so if you, can, um, if you can still hear me. And by the way, I also had some uh, similar in our fraternity brotherhood. I also had some Wi-Fi problems while I was uh, moderating this panel, panel just like you had. So, um, so please over to you. Okay, so my final words for today uh, is um, I would say um, we look at the peculiarities that we have in the region. We have look at um, the opportunities that are there. 
we don't uh, de dive in or, or uh, stay um, with the problem or we look at the problems and we create solutions around that. We should uh, stop focusing on what a startup gets uh, funding and focusing on startups that um, uh, that will really solve the problem within the community. And along the line, the investors will start thinking the way we are thinking and start investing in that life of supporting us to uh, solve, solve the problem, considering the amount of uh, people that we have in all the, uh, in Pakistan and also in Nigeria, the human capital we have, the, talents that we have, I believe if we start looking at concentrating, not focusing on what really the VCs are focusing on, but starting looking at the problems that we have and creating more solutions around that uh, perspective, I believe. Ahmed, please unmute yourself. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I was talking while on mute. So I'm going to repeat myself. So what I said um, is that, guys, focus on your customers, win deals, get those sales in. Okay, that's important. Talk to your customers again and again. Ask them again. Yeah. If you're successful, if you're getting the revenues, investors would come to you, right? Not the other way around. So focus 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 and work hard that that's it uh, no shortcut sorry not has hasn't worked for me any shortcut so <laughs> i'm going to leave my details anyway i think there was a question so if i can open any door for anyone guys just reach out to me right so and good luck keep doing uh, the good work and I and I, I think Mariam had some very interesting information about the startup institutional legal framework. I think that would be fantastic. I think Salim, of course, if you're going across from Pakistan to Nigeria, Nigeria to Pakistan, I think that would be, uh, you know, is the right person to contact. And of course, for Emma, uh, you know, if you're a Pakistani founder interested in Nigerian market, it's very interesting for them to get to know you um, and, and get to uh, speak with you. So over to you, uh, if Chidi and uh, Onika, if you, whoever uh, can go first. Yeah, if you can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, yeah. I think, I think one of the things that um, we've, we've paid attention to um, dealing with what's been going on in the space has been um, having to focus on, I mean, one has been saying, do this over time um, with your businesses. But I mean, the focus really had to shift towards that how you grow your margins as a business and reach self-sustainability. The magic is in when you can control your destinies um, with the funds you've been able to generate for yourselves, where you're in a position that doesn't require you depending on um, investor funds. <laughs> that is when investor funds really starts chasing you. Um, so I, we have seen that um, as a startup um, and as a business. And we started changing our models around that it was painful to let go of some of the things we had invested in over time, but it was wise for us to do it so that we could continue to sustain ourselves as an entity. And that helped us out of the three markets, um, our Nigerian markets then reach self-sustainability where what we've earned and what we've generated started paying off the salaries of, of over 20 people there um, and are taking care of the expenses coming out of that place. We're now pushing our Ghana market and our Uganda market to reach that over the next quarter. And now that puts in our hands our control of our own destiny on how we grow our business into um, 2023. And um, the last thing I'll say is whatever it is you do as a startup, just don't die. I mean, people would say all sorts of things. Um, and if you can find yourself in a position where your business can make enough revenue where you won't just die, then make sure you put yourself in that position because eventually when the tide turns, you will be one of the few people still standing that will benefit from it. Excellent. So Thank you very much. Don't, don't die. Don't die. Don't die. Too soon. No, don't die at all. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, uh, Salim, uh, Salim, if you could. 
Yeah, well, I mean, just to uh, uh, echo Onyeka's uh, remarks, um, remember in any business, there are always two things that are in, uh, common to all businesses. One is cost, the other is revenue. All businesses, whether you're big or small, right? One is in your hands, in your control, the cost. One is your hard work, your determination to get revenues. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. You have to ruthlessly manage your costs. That's first and for you know, I mean, it's a given, but I cannot emphasize it enough times with entrepreneurs who raise capital and then run out of funds. I mean, I've been on the entrepreneurial journey for the last 26 years. I've built two small businesses in two different geographies, doing two different things without raising a penny from an investor. My first startup, I set up 26 years ago, and I sold that in February 2020 after 24 years. That kept the lights on for 24 years. So how did I do that? One, managing the costs, and two, keep generating sales. That is something you have to do ad nauseum. Be top of your game to make sure you're relevant, to make sure your customers want you, and keep pounding the pavements. There are no, you don't, you, no business can say I have enough clients. It, it doesn't exist. However many clients you can have, you can always do with more. So that you have to keep doing, keep expanding, keep knocking on, on doors. And it's the same thing with at Privity. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's self-funded. It's small. I've kept the costs low, but keep out every day, just like any entrepreneur would do. I live and breathe your world because I'm one myself. And that is how I survived. And by God's grace, this is year 18. But I have not gone out and raised money for what I do. Though I help entrepreneurs in their, in their businesses. But that's my focal area today. I mean, once upon a time, I used to pick stocks. Now I pick entrepreneurs. So, you know, the, 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 it's, it's gone from the public markets to the private markets and the early stage private markets. But the game is still the same, looking for good ideas at the end of the day. So that th those are my parting thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, Chitty, if you can unmute and parting thoughts, last thing in the experience. Mm, maybe, maybe um, he's busy, but I think I want like to hear a who has operated a spill the venture for many years, if not decades, and also sold a software in Africa. Uh, if you can add anything, if you have, um, if you're available to add anything, if, if not, then we'll close the session. No problem. I think um, I think thank you very much for all the panelists, all the all the. Um, uh, listeners, there are still thirty of you going uh, after one hour thirty-seven minutes. So that's that's that's. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I think one of the things that we've learned is that in Nigeria, the key markets are financial inclusion, financial services, which is the same case in Pakistan. Huge amount of crowding out for small investors, small uh, users, small SMEs who are who don't get the loans, who don't get the financial services. A uh, similar case in Nigeria. Uh, we have a lot of un, um, unorganized retail in, in Nigeria. We have something called the Kiriana. Kiriana is the dream of a lot of founders in Pakistan, how to organize them, how to give them credit, how to make accounting and how to do accounting for them. So similar is the case in Pakistan. Healthcare is, again, a big area in which Pakistani healthcare startups um, are trying to make um, progress. A lot of the healthcare in Pakistan is driven by the charity sector. What is available, the quality is not enough. Um, the public sector doesn't cater to it. Exactly the same story. Insurance, particularly health insurance, is on the rise. About four years ago, it used to be uh, you know, 2 million people. Now it's about 10 million or 12 million people who are, are insured. So, so any successful startup that, that does well in Nigeria has a huge opportunity in Pakistan. And similarly, like anyone that does well in Pakistan 
has a huge opportunity in Nigeria. And I think if you just focus on Lagos and if you focus on Karachi and you conquer these two cities, you have a unicorn company there because by itself, Karachi, 20 million, Lagos, 20 million, that's a 40 million market density populated, highly mobile. And so I think it would be good to see companies from Karachi growing into Lagos. The other thing that we found out is that it's a hotbed of women entrepreneurship, women founders. And I think I think there is a lot that's also happening in Pakistan. We have Sidra from, from Atoms, we have Med IQ, we have Baglery, we have um, Sehat Kahani, and a lot of these founders. And maybe there is a lot of connectivity that can happen between the women founders of Pakistan, as well as the women founders of, of Nigeria. So with that, I'd like to thank Ali and the Park Launch team for creating these amazing opportunities of the, of the corridor series between different countries. Of course, Nigeria and Pakistan, you know, there was this time when the world was a single continent. Everything was connected together. It was called the Pangaea. That was how it was called until the tectonic movements separated them. And I do believe that I think Nigeria and Pakistan were connected. Geographically, because we are otherwise so similar, and of course we have had, uh, you know, uh, uh, billions and millions of years of separate history, but somehow we are very connected, very very similar to each other. And hopefully, some of the tech ventures, some of the some of the investing side, and the founders can collaborate and can build billion dollar companies. You know, we don't have to rely on capital from the Silicon Valley. We don't have to rely on the tech talent from the Silicon Valley. We have what it takes. We have within us all the solutions, the problems, but also all the solutions to create very successful uh, billion dollar companies. So thank you very much everyone for joining and for being part of this panel and making this possible. And for the panelists, I would like to thank you for the attention, for the time and all the answers that you've given. You certainly added a lot to my knowledge. Thank you very much Park Launch and Ali and the team for making it happen and um, uh, good night from Karachi and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye.